And welcome to Keeping It Real with Grandma Jo in faith and in truth. Progressive Christianity is another gospel? Is it even Christianity at all? Well, today our guest, our featured guest, Elisa Childers, has done extensive study on this topic, and she will talk about her path, and she will bring out some key doctrinal truths about this subject. I love Elisa Childers. I have been following her for quite a while, and she's kind of like a mentor for me since I'm so new on YouTube. And Elisa Childers is known for equipping Christians to identify core beliefs of historic Christianity and discern its counterfeits, as well as proclaiming the gospel with clarity, and I love this, kindness and truth. Elisa emulates speaking truth in love and has the highest respect for others, even those who disagree with her. So I am blessed and grateful to introduce to you, Alisa Childers. Hello, Alisa. Hi, it's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. I'm going to see if I can bring up uh, your channel here, um, host screen, and let's see if I can bring up your channel. And this is you. That's me. Yes. <laughs> so I'm so appreciative. I know that I have spent time reading your book, Another Gospel, and it speaks so clearly, and it it points out so many of the fingers that progressive Christianity has in other areas. And so mm. I'm very excited, as well as I know this is an extremely important topic today, and it's one of your passions. And so I would love if you could start by maybe telling us a little bit about your channel, a little bit about your path, sort of how did you get here? How did you get to the book? And then we'll kind of go into some of those questions that that were in the book that talk about progressive Christianity. Why is it dangerous? Um, why is it another gospel? And is it even Christianity at all? So tell me a little bit uh, about you. Well, I, I never thought I would be doing what I'm doing today. I, I was always more into music. That was kind of my path. And then essentially what ended up happening is I spent a few years in the contemporary Christian music industry. And after that came to a close. My husband and I started attending a church in the Bible Belt here in the middle of Tennessee, where we live. And we loved it. We plugged right in. We loved the pastor. We loved the people. And after attending there about eight months, the pastor invited me to be a part of a small group study that he compared to seminary. He said, if you go through this four-year class, you'll come out with a seminary level education. And I was really excited about that because I wanted to dig deeper into my faith and know why I believe all the things that I have believed my whole life. And so uh, long story short, and I tell the longer version in the book, Another Gospel, um, but basically everything I'd ever believed about Christianity was uh, sort of put on this chopping block. Everything, you know, the beliefs that I had held so dear about the atonement and the resurrection and the reliability of the Bible, 
These things were all deconstructed, picked apart, explained away. And it threw me into a dark night of the soul. That was a very, very dark time of doubt where I really came up to the edge of agnosticism. I think maybe I had, I, it was weird. It was like double-minded because I was sort of like, I didn't know, but I, I had walked with Jesus my whole life. So I was very double-minded. But I cried out to God and just said, Lord, if there are answers for this stuff, I need to know what they are. You know, I need I need you to send me a lifeboat because I'm drowning in doubt. And so God in his faithfulness led me to the study of apologetics, which led to uh, reconstructing my faith, rebuilding my faith, and ultimately giving me a, an opportunity to help others do that in their own lives and know the reasons why Christianity is reasonable. It's It's a reasonable conclusion, and I think it's actually the best explanation of reality. Wow, that is pretty, pretty intense. You mentioned this class. Is this the class that you spoke about in your book? Yes, that's the one. Okay, so just briefly, um, I know you're going to talk a little bit about how you stayed in that class as he was deconstructing everything you ever knew about Christ and faith. And I wanted to ask you, because as I was reading the book, I kept thinking, why are you staying in this class? And yeah. if I was teaching, if I, let's say a young um, somebody I was mentoring or somebody came and asked me, you know, what do you think? My first impulse, in, unless they are really, which you seem to be really grounded, uh, and th there was a call to that, my first thought would be run, run the other mm -hmm. way, which is what we kind of say about these other doctrines in progressive Christianity. If you get into this, run the other way. So what caused you to stay so long in that, that it just mm -hmm. sort of broke your heart to some degree? Well, there's probably two reasons. So the first one was that the pastor said something interesting in the beginning. He said, what you're going to learn in this class, you'll never be able to unknow. And so I was so deep in that I knew that if I, if I felt like if I just left, then all of this undoing would just be sitting there. And I, I would, I, I knew I would have to continue through it because it was just too intense. And the claims that he had made were too large, Right. But there was another reason. And the other reason was that there were baby Christians in the class. There were a couple of people who this was literally their first experience with Christianity. And so part of me f was staying so that I could try to debate him and at least show them that there was a, another way of looking at it. Um, so I, I would say those are probably the two main reasons is just I felt like I was in so deep. I, I just had to come out the other side. And also for the for the other baby Christians that were there. What a gift. What a blessing that you kind of hung in there. Um, sounds like God had sort of put you there for many reasons, not only your own life, like you said, but for for others as well. I hope so. Yeah, I hope I hope it had some kind of a positive effect on where they ended up landing. Yeah, well, God's word does not return void. So I know that it was so impactful. And your commitment to truth is one of the reasons that you are a mentor to me in terms of how you mm -hmm. respectfully deal with people who disagree with you and yet hold firm to the truth. Can you touch a little bit about when you talk about deconstruction? I'm not a real big deconstruction fan. Um, mm -hmm. I believe that uh, vetting is probably a better word. Um, mm -hmm. Making sure the faith is ours. I did a video on it. And some of the questions was, was it ever really my faith to begin with? Was it the pastors or the cultures or, you know, something I was grown up with? How do you discern doubt like the the mm -hmm. disciples had uh, versus a deconstruction that ends up basically putting our faith in the trash can you talk a little bit about those differences yeah interestingly uh this is something i'm thinking through a lot right now because in the book another gospel i describe what happened to me as a deconstruction but currently right now i'm actually researching and writing a book on deconstruction and the deeper i get down that rabbit hole the less i want to refer to what happened to me as a deconstruction and so i think that um the, what we need to acknowledge is that a lot of people are using that word in a lot of different ways for some people deconstruction just means changing your mind on a theological issue and it can mean anything from that to completely leaving the faith and so what i'm trying to re argue for is I think deconstruction is a very specific thing. As you see it manifest online and as you trace its roots through postmodern philosophy, it really is, I believe, a rejection of the, the uh, authority of the Bible and it's an embrace of the authority of the self. That's really what deconstruction is. And ultimately, that's not really what I did. I, was, I, I did get caught up in a little bit of postmodernism unintentionally, but I never 
was just like, oh, I'm going to pick what I like or, and I'm not saying people in deconstruction do that, but often they're so influenced by postmodern relativism, which is a rejection of the idea that absolute truth can even be known, that they end up rebuilding their version of authentic Christianity based on what they think is good or bad, oppressive or liberating or helpful or harmful. And the only problem with that is that sometimes what's actually true and false doesn't line up with our personal idea of what's helpful or harmful. So we have to line up with truth to even know what's actually helpful or harmful. So I think uh, as, de as we see the movement of deconstruction emerge online, um, this is not a phenomenon that has anything to do with affirming objective truth or bi the biblical authority. So I think that if you're doubting, if you're questioning, if you're changing your mind on theological issues, if you're trying to line up your faith with uh, the word of God, if you were raised in a stream that believes on biblical things and you're getting rid of those beliefs and replacing them with authentic beliefs, if you're engaging your doubts, asking the hard questions, I say, that is great. We should all be doing that. But let's not call that deconstruction, right? Let's call that reformation or let's call that, you know, being a Christian, <laughs> being obedient to the Bible, sanctification. But I think the word deconstruction should be reserved for what we actually do see as a convert a deconversion of sorts certainly some people who deconstruct still call themselves christians but it it's uh, it's almost never reflecting a historic version of the core doctrines being still in place and and so the authority switches from the authority of the bible to the authority of the self that's my thesis that's what i want to persuade people of in the in the uh, deconstruction book that I'm working on. Uh, so, so I think the main difference like, to answer your question between say doubt and deconstruction is I think doubt can be a very healthy process. Um, if, if you doubt is not the opposite of faith. Doubt is like, you know, you believe something and you're like, is this really true? But you're pursuing truth, right? If you're pursuing truth, I think it's great to engage your doubts. A deconstruction signifies something a little deeper and it has to do with authority. That's an excellent breakdown and clarification because your book, even though you're doing it more extensively right now, your book really does a good job of pointing out this doctrinal truth as you go through, even in the older manuscripts, talking about these truths are stuff, foundational truths that you can sort of launch and build your life, heart and faith on. They're not subjective. And I yeah. loved how you brought, I, I loved how you brought that up in the book. And I appreciate you saying that because I'm one of the few that really does not support or like that term yeah. deconstruction. And when I heard you use it, I thought, I, I don't know if I believe deconstruction is really authentic. I, I do know, I guess if you get to the point where you still love Christ and everything's back in order yeah. and everything vetted to the word of God, then it came out okay. But most of the time, what I see is it just gets put in yeah. the trash. It gets really twisted to a world view. And, and so I just, I love that you mentioned that. Thank you so much for that clarification. Yeah. As we deal with the foundational truths, can you, in your book, I loved, you talked about boats and anchors. And that's how you kind of start your book in terms of protecting the foundational truths. Can you talk a little bit about that or elaborate about, I don't want to give all of your book. I, there's just a few points that I want because I want people to read it. And it will be linked in the description, of course, below. Um, but tell me a little bit about that boat and anchor analogy yeah. that you brought up in your book. Yeah, so that's actually from the foreword that Lee Strobel wrote, which I thought was such a cool analogy that he used because he basically said, you know, if, if your faith is like a boat and you don't have a solid anchor, you mm -hmm. it can look to you from your perspective like you're still all good. You're in the, you're in the right place. Everything's good. And you won't even have noticed that you've drifted hundreds of miles from where you're supposed to be, but you put that anchor down and that's how, that's kind of that objective standard that keeps ev everything in place. And, and that's kind of how progressive Christianity works is that it's not like progressive Christians show up on your doorstep and say, Hey, we're progressive Christians. We'd like to take over your church. It's something that happens very slow and subtly, kind of like that boat metaphor where the boat just sort of starts drifting. And, you know, maybe you drift 10 feet and you're like, it's just 10 feet. It's fine. It's not a big deal. But before you know it, you've drifted 10 more feet. And before you know it, like I mentioned before, you're hundreds of miles from your destination. And so I think progressive Christianity works more like that. It's a subtle shift that doesn't usually happen overnight. Hmm. I agree with that. I did a little piece and I talked about how just subtle false teaching takes you off course just a little bit. But as we know, GPS wise is if we're off course just a little bit, you may not reach your destination unless you yeah. reset course. So again, that was another thing that just really spoke to me. I appreciate that. 
You spoke about trusting the Bible over time. Um, and it's similar to, I think it's your grandma peach, grandma's peach cobbler recipe. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about I, the foundational truths, the Bible, trusting the word of God mm -hmm. as it's written over time, you compared that sort of to a recipe and explained how you really can trust the original document or the original recipe. Can you talk a little bit about that? That was very helpful. Oh, thank you. Yeah. So I, I used my grandma's peach cobbler recipe as an example of a science called textual criticism. Now, before anybody freaks out about that fancy word, it's really just the it's a science scholars use to reconstruct ancient documents when we no longer have the originals. So we don't have the original New Testament documents. We don't have the original Shakespeare. We don't have original Plato or Socrates or even the Gettysburg Address. We don't have the originals of these of these documents. And so uh, scientists or uh, scholars will come use this science of textual criticism. So basically what you do is you take the handwritten copies, which we call manuscripts, and to do to be able to reconstruct those originals, you want as many as possible and you want the earliest ones as possible. So uh, with the New Testament, we have over 5,000 uh, manuscripts. These are handwritten copies. Sometimes their whole books is one manuscript. Sometimes it's just a little fragment the size of a postage stamp that would count as one manuscript. But what scholars will do is they'll take all the manuscripts they have for a particular book and compare them and say, OK, so what do we see emerging here now? Because there are so many handwritten uh, manuscripts, there's going to be variations between them. So these are handwritten by humans. So there's going to be uh, mis you know, words that are spelled differently than in other manuscripts. There's going to be uh, changes in word order. There's going to be uh, times when scholars got tired and you can see that that as they were copying, they, they got a little tired. As the, I mean, scholars can see all of these things. And so that might make people think, well, gosh, can we even trust them? Because if you have this many copies and there's all these differences. But what we have to understand is it's kind of like peach cobbler recipe. My grandma's recipe was real simple. Of course, the New Testament manuscript is a lot more complex than this, but it was just three ingredients, cup of, cup of, cup of, cup of flour, cup of sugar and a cup of canned peaches with the juice. And so if imagine if there was like 10 handwritten copies of that manuscript, you're going to have one that's got a big coffee ring on it and you can't tell what the second word is, right? You're going to have one manuscript that maybe they spelled butter wrong. You can have another manuscript that might be torn in half and all you can see is one cup of flour. But if you have 5,000 of those manuscripts and that now you're going to get a cup of, you're going to get flour, sugar, and peaches. And, and you're, nobody's going to question what the original said just because there are a few that have these uh, different variations in them. So um, that's kind of the, the, met, the analogy that I use to try to explain how this works. But that's basically how we know that our New Testament manuscripts have been copied accurately. And by the way, they've been copied more accurately, um, like exponentially more accurately than any other ancient work of, of classical literature. We don't have nearly the amount or the early manuscripts for other classical works of literature than we do for the New Testament. So it's, it's a very solidly uh, transmitted document. So you had a scripture verse that you mentioned um, in that book. And so I thought maybe, you know, you could, we could read it here real quick because you mentioned it. It says in first Corinthians 15, three to five, for I delivered to you as of the first importance, what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then the 12. And then you refer to 1 Corinthians, and if Christ had not been raised, your faith is basically, basically futile, and you are still in your sins. And then you referenced 2 Peter, and that talks about um, there are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. So how does that get twisted. So you're talking about there's this truth that was handed down by Christ through the disciples, through all of the forefathers, and then it becomes twisted. We have, I mean, it seems so clear to us when we're reading the Bible, but then how does it get so far out of whack? How does it get so far twisted? Well, that first scripture that you put up, the first Corinthians 15, that's actually a creed. So a lot of Christians don't realize that our New Testament is embedded, embedded with early creeds that predate the books they're recorded in by many years. And I even used the peach cobbler um, example again to demonstrate how that's the case. You know, if I wrote a cookbook in 2022 that I included my grandma's old recipe that she first passed down to me when I was a teenager, 
the cookbook would be from 2022, but the recipe contained within it would date to the 80s or even earlier. So that's kind of how these creeds work. Paul recorded this creed. This is not something Paul made up. This is something he received that he's passing down. And that's one of the ways scholars know they're about to read a creed. And so if we look at what's in this creed, this is even according to famously skeptical scholar Bart Ehrman, this was Christianity in a nutshell for Paul. This is this is not something Paul made up. This is what was passed to him. And so uh, my argument in the book is that Christianity can't be any less than this. And it does get twisted. So let's take a look at what's in here. You have that Christ died for our sins. So there's a divine reason for his death. It's He wasn't just crucified to submit to, you know, the humans wanting their pound of flesh. He's not just showing us the way of forgiveness or what forgiveness looks like, although that certainly is present in the scriptures, but he's died for our sins. So there's a, there's a, a, a an implicit substitution happening here. The, there's something that is being accomplished in the divine realm with his death. It's not just a natural phenomenon. He died for our sins. So I would argue that what we mean when we say Jesus died for our sins is in that core um, box, because Paul says this is first importance, right? Then notice it says in accordance with the scripture. So you have biblical backing and that he was buried. That's evidence. So you have a theological belief, biblical backing, and then evidence and reality. And then you have the same pattern again, that he was raised. We've got the resurrection. This is non-negotiable. We can't agree to disagree about that. And in accordance with the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas in the 12. That's again, eyewitness testimony, evidence and reality. And so when, when it talks about the things getting twisted, right? Scriptures are getting twisted. That's exactly what we see happen in progressive Christianity, because in progressive Christianity, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross is referred to as cosmic child abuse. It's somehow God the Father requiring his son to die a bloody death makes him an abuser. And so they reject that view of the atonement, um, which I think is is pretty clearly implied in this creed, right? Um, they reject the authority of the scriptures for the most part. Now, you know, progressive Christianity is broad. There's it's fluid. There's a broad spectrum of beliefs. But for the most part, among the thought leaders, biblical authority is rejected. B certainly biblical inerrancy is rejected. And so so that's gone. And then, uh, you know, the resurrection. I have found that among progressive Christians, you'll find maybe 50 percent of the thought leaders that will just openly say, yes, I believe Jesus was bodily raised from the from the dead. So I want to acknowledge that. But it's not viewed as something that anybody would would divide over. It's you know, but Paul is saying, no, like the verse you put up there, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. If Jesus was not raised, Christianity is false and we might as well all go do something else because it, we're still in our sins. And so I think um the thing about progressive Christianity is that it really does twist these things because some progressive Christians might even say, I do believe Jesus died for my sins. But what they mean is that he died because of human sin. In other words, humans wanted to kill him. So, you know, he's so he died, you know, but there's a divine reason given in that creed. And I think that's the thing we need to to bear in mind. So. In talking about how does it get twisted, how does progressive Christianity bleed into other areas? You talk about critical theory. I know everybody says critical race theory, but you encompass so many of that. So these little fingers go out that are distorted, and then they begin to distort other things, and other things are creeping in. Can you talk a little bit about that for me in terms yeah. of what, what you meant or clarify? How does this progressive Christianity become criti into critical theory, which then distorts other doctrinal mm -hmm. truth. Yeah, well, a lot of, you know, obviously there's a lot of race conversations happening in the country right now. And uh, one of the things that I've observed in the progressive Christianity movement is that they're going to jump on board with culture wherever they're at with these kind of topics. And a lot of even faithful, biblically faithful Christians are confused by that because they're thinking, well, I, I'm against racism. I want to do, I want to seek justice in the world. I want to acknowledge, you know, the sins of the past and all of that is, is good. And I think in holy, but the problem with critical theory is that unity is not the goal with critical theory, with critical theory, the end goal is, is not for everybody to end up forgiving each other, loving each other, making things right, let justice be done, and then we move on. It's this perpetual pitting oppressor versus op uh, oppressed. And that's an endless cycle because eventually if, they, if, if everything swings the other way, then the oppressed are going to become the oppressor and then it'll swing back the other way and then those oppressed will become the oppressor. And it's just an endless cycle of pitting people against each other. 
Now, I think the thing, like you mentioned, I appreciate you mentioning that it's more than just critical race theory, because critical theory is a discipline in academia that trickles down into everything. You can't, you, you cannot keep the ideas of critical theory isolated only to race, because any sort of inequality or unequal outcome is viewed as oppression, that's not only going to stay in the realm of race, that's going to bleed out into issues of sexuality. So, for example, with the influence of critical theory, for to say that two gay men cannot get married, of course, I know that the law has changed now, but before that, um, well, because heterosexual couples can, then that's an oppression, right? So then that's viewed as an oppression. This is why uh, in the critical theory view, any theological belief that would limit what women might be able to do, for example, is viewed as oppressive because ultimately the end goal isn't that everybody flourishes in the role that God gave them. The end goal is for everybody to have the exact same outcome. And so if a woman maybe is told, you know, you can't serve in the pastorate, well, that's viewed as oppression. So it trickle, it, you cannot keep it to just race. It will trickle into absolutely everything. And it only wrote everything. And I'll, I'll end with this question with this. There was, there was a video, uh, it was a pastor and two atheists talking about critical theory. And this was before this became sort of mainstream when everybody was talking about it. And it was a very interesting conversation. I believe it's called the Trojan horse something, but it's James Lindsay and Peter Bogosian. And James Lindsay, I believe it was James Lindsay, the atheist said, if I wanted to, if I was one of those atheists that wanted to completely destroy the church, I would make all the pastors woke. And I thought that was so powerful. And, and it really served, I think, to be prophetic because we do see the church being destroyed from the inside out with this infection of critical theory. Now, how that relates with progressive Christianity is that progressive Christianity has adopted, whether they admit it or not, they've adopted the language of critical theory really as their gospel, which is going to emerge as a social justice gospel. So it takes the emphasis off of grace, off of justification, off of sin and redemption, and puts it onto activism. And um, that activism is going to be in line with the causes that culture is taking up. And so I think it's a, it's a, it's a hugely important issue for Christians to be aware of right now. Wow. Excellent clarification. You had a scripture verse I want to bring up as we kind of wrap up that thought process of how do we determine error from truth? You had Matthew 7, 15 through 16. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Are figs from thistles? Can you elaborate a little bit as how do we determine error from truth when there's so much it's a little 11 is that few degrees off sometimes mm -hmm. they're they say this and that's accurate and this and that's accurate and this and that's accurate but then these two or three things aren't <clears throat> but they're not the um wisdom issues they're critical issues as you were talking about which again these are our members of the body of our christian believers are being so deceived and in mm -hmm. and unfortunately as we because we we're going to wrap up in jude with contending with the faith my concern, my fear, and my sadness in my heart is that this is in the church, like you're talking about. That's why progressive Christianity, another gospel, the book, how it relates to doctrinal truth was so important because as you, <clears throat> Elisa, <clears throat> represent Christ well, excuse me, as we in our ministries seek to glorify the word of God, get, bring glory to God through the word, this is key. To me, this is key. And I would love for you to expound about that because we have to determine how do you know truth from error when mm. it seems so right? It seems so comfortable. It seems so doctrinally sound when it is so completely not. Mm. Well, I think it's important to note that these are the words of Jesus here. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. This is Jesus calling false teachers wolves. And he tells us how to recognize them, recognize them by their fruits. And if you expound what the New Testament and Jesus in particular is talking about with fruit, it's not judging if they've got happiness in their life or if they're exuding joy or peace. Um, the fruits of the spirit, that's a different thing. But when Jesus says recognize them by their fruits, it's always in the context of repentance and walking in obedience to the commands of Christ. In other words, if there's a teacher that's giving you the okay on sin or leading you into sin or is, you know, manif like characterized in their own life by living openly sinful life lifestyles, you will recognize that these are wolves. Now, I think it's important to make a distinction 
that when when Jesus said, you have to recognize these wolves, this is your job, right? We have to do that, realizing that there are sheep who are being deceived, and then there are wolves, wolves who are the deceivers. The wolves could equally be self-deceived. It doesn't necessarily mean that because someone is technically a false teacher and what Jesus called a wolf, that they know they're deceiving people or that they're doing it intentionally. Um, they might be entirely self-deceived. In fact, I predict most of the uh, thought leaders and the people promoting these ideas within progressive Christianity are very sincere, very earnest. They think they're on the right side of this. I, I, I have no doubt. But Jesus said, this is our job as Christians, and we are to protect the church because there are sheep who are being deceived by the wolves. And so um, this is this is something that is so counterculture to us right now, because we're living in a culture where you can do whatever you want as long as you're nice, right? You just have to be nice. <laughs> it's just like that's the highest virtues, kindness and niceness. As long as you're that, you can live however you want. You can so things are upside down. They're backwards. But biblically speaking, I mean, you can still be kind, but you have to be on guard and recognize that there are people coming after sheep to pick them off, whether mm -hmm. they realize that's what they're doing or not. Yes, I remember when I, I also talk about a piece of that. I said there's a difference between um, building a bridge for the lost to come home and building a bridge for the wolves to devour the sheep. That's, that's very good. I like that. And so that's I, I think that's kind of what I hear you speaking about, and I agree with that. Well, I, that is so powerful. And again, I'm, we're going to encourage people to sort of definitely read read the book. I'm not one to always refer books outside of the, the Bible unless I've just really vetted them. And they do bring you and take you to the Word of God, because I think that that's so important. The Word of God stands uh, for that. And I loved how that book did it. I, I literally enjoyed the whole seven hours that I was, I listened to it audibly. I enjoyed it all because it was so thoroughly equipped with the, the word of God. And it kept bringing me back to that, you know, even to vet it, it was, it was just really well done. So I encourage everybody to do that. As we wrap this up, uh, and Elisa, I want to tell you, thank you so much for your time. You end kind of with Jude in terms of contending with the faith. And I'd really like to talk a little bit about that because that's actually where my heart is right now. It says in Jude 1, 3, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, which I thought was interesting. He's, he really wanted to do the gospel yeah. and the salvation. Yeah. This is my heart. And that's what we are. When we go out, we said, we really want to talk about the gospel and the truth of Christ. But he says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, to the saints, which is again, talking about that original doctrinal truth that's being brought forth through the word of God. It's nothing new. It's not like all of a sudden, I'm just going to tell you my thoughts. This was delivered to the saints once and for all, and we need to contend. Can you and your uh, thoughts define what you think that contend for the faith means and how do we do it in a cultural that's so div divisive? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think about a lot of people get very uncomfortable with the idea of having to defend the faith or contend for the faith and contending for the faith. It's going to, it's going to branch out across so many different areas. It's going to branch out to what pastors are preaching from the pulpit. It's going to branch out into uh, how people think about discipleship. It's going to branch out into how we raise our kids and how we relate with each other uh, in our families and our marriages. I mean, it's going to branch out into absolutely everything. And I think contending for the faith just means guarding the faith, protecting this beautiful gift that the Lord has given us. And when something is beautiful and precious, it's worth protecting. This is why we lock our doors at night, right? This is why some we put fences up so that bad guys can't get in our house and we want to protect our children because we love them. Not because we're intolerant of anyone, but because they're they're in our, they're our charge. We're responsible to protect our kids. So we lock our doors, we close our windows and we lock them. And we tell our kids to look both ways before they cross the street. And we watch them when they play. And this is all contending. And I think it's the same with the gospel. We have to be very, very vigilant because, because we talked about that boat drifting. If we don't do it, it might just be a little drift today, but that little drift turns into a big drift. And before you know it, you've lost sight of the gospel. So I think contending has to do in every aspect of our life, from our own personal uh, 
devotion to Christ and spending time in his word and in prayer to how we disciple others and raise our kids and live in our families and our communities and our churches. Uh, but we can't just sit down and let the false ideas take over because they will. If it's um, it, There was an interesting thing. I think it was Al Mohler who talked about this a few years ago when liberalism first kind of took over the church the first time in the early 1900s, late 1800s. And he said it was really the moderates. It was the it was the middle. It was the people who actually agreed with the right theology, but they just weren't willing to speak up that really caused uh, that overtake to happen in a lot of cases. So it's that mushy middle. They got to speak up. And that's all of us. You know, you can't leave it to the thought leaders. It's got to be every single person in every church and every family to speak up and to contend because it can't just be a few of us on YouTube doing it. Oh, you are speaking my heart. You are speaking my heart. Um, here is the clip of where you can get that book. Um, Elisa, if you want to tell us, I think this is the elisachilders.com. Yeah, and this, I, this is the um, the curriculum yep. for another gospel. So churches can go through a six-week small group study with that, and you can get that on Tyndale.com. So there's a six there's a six DVD series and then a participant guide for each person going through that they can fill out uh, week by week. And and so I'm, I'm excited about that one. Great. So for all of our watchers and our listeners that are going to uh, connect with us over time, again, links are going to be in the description. You can find how to reach uh, Elisa Childers and her YouTube channel. Um, here's the Another Gospel and how you can really incorporate that as a study, which I highly encourage you to do. It was very, again, doctrinally sound, well-written, I just personally love the audio version of it because I felt like I'm spending the day with you as my sister yes. in Christ. So again, I know uh, you've been uh, gracious and you've got a, a time frame that we need to stick to. So I'm just going to close with asking you, what is your most meaningful or favorite verse? Like favorite mm -hmm. verse over time or most meaningful right now in, in the season that God has you in? What would you say is the most meaningful verse for you right yeah. now? So hard to pick one. I sort of right now am living in First Peter. That's just sort of what I'm, I'm studying it. I'm also trying to, I'm trying to memorize the whole first chapter of first Peter. And so um, I've gotten about halfway through that, just living in that um, talking about, oh gosh, it's, it, you know, it's when you memorize scripture, it really gets in you. It, you, you would just begin to, to acknowledge and realize things about it that might've just flown by if you were just reading it. And um, there's all, also I've memorized part of, I think chapter three, where it talks about um, Christ suffering in the flesh. And I love that because it really has to do with, with saying no to sin. And, and it gives us strength to know that we can resist sin in our own lives. And uh, so, yeah, first Peter I'm living in, but all time favorite, maybe Psalm 119 just talks about how much the psalmist loved the word of God and meditates on his word and how good the word of God is. And all of his commands are good because I think that's what is under so much fire these days. I love that. I love how you use the word meditation. It, it just drives me nuts that the world has hijacked our terms yeah, and, yeah. and that that meditation is not emptying our mind, but it's right. actually filling it with the Perfect. word of God Yes, and, yeah. and chewing on it like, you know, uh, a cow with cud and yeah. just um, just taking it all in. So I so appreciate that. Well, I'm just going to say, you know, Lord, I just pray for Elisa and her ministry. I pray that you refresh her spirit daily as she continues to do everything she can to gl bring glory to you and to shine a light and to mark um, and uh, avoid a false teaching. And she does it in, in the way of her YouTube channel and in her life. I know as she is uh, combining her ministry and her family, as we all do, um, I do too, as a mother and a wife and, and a grandmother, um, I just ask that we all get refreshed daily with your word and with the Holy Spirit and that your wisdom just seeps through us and that everything we say, everything we do, and even everything that we think brings glory to you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Elisa, I'll talk to you backstage for about two minutes. And uh, I want to tell you, thank you so much for taking the time to just talk about so in depth on this extremely important topic about progressive Christianity, how it is another gospel. It's not Christianity. It's very dangerous. And you were bringing light to that. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. I loved it. It was, this was a great conversation. Thanks so much.